All right, let me get so you can see me here, hopefully. And um, want to welcome you to our second Monshire at li Live at Home program. Um, we are very excited today to have Dr. Jerry De Silva with us. He is a professor over at Dartmouth, but a great Monshire friend. And i um, super excited to have him share some cool things. He is a paleoanthropologist. You can kind of maybe figure out what he studies if you think about what a paleontologist does and what an anthropologist does. He might be able to help you a little figure that out in a bit. Before we get started, though, there's just a couple things you should know about how this is going to work today. So this is a webinar format. So you're only going to see um, me just for a minute here and then Jerry and some of his family in a minute here for most of it. You don't see the other participants and your camera's not on. So you can, you know, do whatever. And we are gonna be using two features that you can see if you either touch your screen or use your mouse to touch your screen. Um, the two features that we're gonna use, I think you'll see them show up at the bottom are the Q&A. So if you have a question, please type it in there. It helps me keep track of all the questions. And, um, and then I can let Jerry know that there is a question that comes up. And then we also can use the chat. So if you, you want, want to answer something or have an idea or just think something's cool, go ahead and throw that in the chat. There's a third function there called the hand raise. We're not gonna be using that today, so don't worry about that one. Occasionally, we'll have questions for you that will pop up on the screen and you'll have to answer them um, using, using that. So we are going to here in a second, um, I'm gonna pass it over to Jerry and let him introduce and then as questions come in, um, we'll start to throw them towards him as well. So let me just switch this over and Jerry, you're on. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Montshire at Home. Uh, this is my son, Ben, and I'm surrounded by bones here and, and by fossils. Uh, as Amy said, I'm a paleoanthropologist, and that's a fancy word that just means I study ancient human fossils. So we look like this today. Uh, this is what our skull looks like, but we find fossils that demonstrate that Long ago, millions of years ago, we looked more like this, with the smaller brains, snoutier faces, our teeth were a little different. And so every year I travel to this Africa. Yep. Yeah, every year I travel to Africa uh, to try to find fossilized remains of, of our ancestors. But along the way, we find bones of other animals, lots and lots and lots and lots of bones of other animals. So when we find these ancient bones, we have to try to figure out what they are. And the first question that we usually ask when we find a fossil is not what animal is it from, but what part of the body is it? Because it turns out that heads look like heads, look like heads, look like heads, no matter what animal you are. That you can find places where there are eyes, where there's a nose, where there are teeth, where there are ears, and where there's a spot for the brain. And so you may have seen the video that, I, that we posted earlier in the week, where I showed this skull here, which was a coyote skull, and illustrated beautifully just a moment ago by Rebecca, I believe in this kind of pose as well, with the howling pose. Um, even though this is shaped differently from this one, we can still tell it's a skull, right? Because you've got places for the eyes, there are teeth, you have places where there's the brain, right? And there's a long snout on this particular creature, which tells us that it's well adapted for the sense of smell. And we know dogs can do that, right? They can smell things really well. So we can this use- This one has a bit of a smell, snout too. Exactly. So we can use what we know about animals today to try to answer questions about animals that are long extinct, including ancestral humans. And so I think there's a poll question that Amy can put up uh, where I want to know by the end of this, if you're interested in seeing the uh, oldest fossil that I have here that I've brought back, uh, uh, to my home from my lab, or the biggest bone uh, that I have. And it's so big, I couldn't even fit it in my house. So it's outside uh, on my lawn. So go ahead and take a moment to look at that, uh, that poll and answer the question of whether you want to see the biggest bone, the oldest bone, or, oh geez, I guess you can, you can choose both. 
I know. I gave him the option to choose both because it's too hard to choose. I know it is. It is. Well, they're very similar to each other. They're related to each other. All right. So you have just another couple seconds to vote if you haven't yet. And let's see, a couple more people still waiting to vote. Um, and here I'm going to end the poll and see what we've got. So, oh, just like oh, me, look at that. can't choose. Oh, only eight percent for the oldest. That 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 pains me as a paleontologist. <laughs> but for those four of you that voted for that, um, maybe you want to go into paleontology. You want to study fossils. That would be great. But I'll make sure you see both um, by by the end. So we can learn so much about bones. Bones tell these amazing stories about animals living today and animals in the past. So for instance, I just had our coyote friend up here and notice that it has those big canines in the front. So the teeth of skulls can tell us about diet. They can tell us about what animals eat. So those canines in front and notice those forward facing eyes, right? The eyes right in front, eyes in the front hunt. So animals like this with their eyes in the front and their big canine teeth are going to be hunters. Whereas we'll find skulls of other animals like this one, right, where the eyes are not quite in the front. They're not looking forward. The eyes are more on the side. You see, H eyes in the side hide. Eyes in the front hunt, eyes in the side hide. So this is from an animal that also has a really long snout, right, so it has a good sense of smell. Big eyes, good sense of sight, looking on the side though, so they're not hunters, and there are no canine teeth, there are no fang teeth. In fact, the teeth are all flat back here, and they're gonna be useful for chomping on, uh, on, on, on vegetation, and chomping on uh, vegetation people's um, flower beds they like to go after these days. And so this happens to be from a deer. So we have um, all of the skulls that I'm going to show you, for the most part, are um, are from New England, and so we've got uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, hunting animals here, like coyotes, and then we have so the, these are carnivores, and then we have herbivores uh, like this deer. And Gary, I throw yeah. a question your way. Oh, totally. Yeah, let's do questions. So yeah, we've got a couple here. One, somebody was just wondering if you were showing real skulls. I am, yeah. So I am showing real skulls, uh, except for the human skull. Uh, this one is plastic. Exactly. So we never show real human skulls in demonstrations like this. And this one is bone. Exactly. So the fossils that we find are so precious and so important uh, that we the fossils remain uh, in the countries where they're found. So this particular fossil was discovered in South Africa, and it's in a vault, uh, protected vault in South Africa. So this is just a, a replica. A cast. All of the others that I have here uh, are indeed uh, real, uh, uh, real bones. Um, in fact, and we can put up the next poll question after I show you this one, this tiny little bone here was discovered uh, just a couple of days ago by my dog. So my dog was in my yard running around and all of a sudden it got something and I knew it was up to something um, and it was racing around, it was all excited and it wouldn't drop what it had in its mouth. And finally it did, and it was a bone. So I want you to look at this bone, okay? It's small, just fits between my fingers like this. Look at its shape, all right? And then Amy can put up a poll question of what bone do you think this is? What part of the body, not what animal, but what part of the body might this be from? And you can sing along while you answer this question. And Jerry, while um, people are answering the question, there's a couple others that have come up. So at some point you can hit on those. One is just why do we study fossils? And then Eli wants to know if you've ever found a dinosaur bone while you've been looking for your human fossils. I have not, no. Dinosaurs lived long, long before uh, people did. And so dinosaur fossils are found in rocks that are much older than the rocks that I search for fossils in. So the youngest dinosaur fossils are about 65 million years old, whereas the oldest human fossils ever found are about only seven million years old. I say only seven, right? But that's a, that's a long time ago. Um, 
So the poll has been answered and indeed this is a toe, exactly, this is a toe bone. Now we can compare it to our own foot, right? This is a human foot right here. And this here is a toe bone, okay? So it looks very similar in shape to our own toe bones. So if we compare this right here to our toes. Now, when you find a bone, it's good to compare it to human bones uh, to know whether you should call the police or not, right? If you find a bone. And there's, there's no way this is a human. This doesn't have the right shape for a human. It's too big, it's robust. It means that this animal is walking on its toes more than we do, okay? And so there are some animals that walk right on the tips of their toes, walk Dogs. right on uh, their, the, the, their, their hooves. Dogs, coyotes. Um, yeah, this, this is not a dog or coyote though. This happens to be from a deer. So this is a, a deer uh, toe bone. It's shaped a lot like ours, but it's bigger and thicker. So again, when we find a bone, um, we can identify what it might be from just from, uh, just from its shape. Because whether you're a human or a deer or a coyote or an ancient human or a rabbit or an otter, your uh, bones are going to look similar uh, to, to one another, but they're going to be these subtle differences in size and shape that allow the animals in our environment to be adapted for what they actually do. So uh, another question about some of the bones you found. Um, one is somebody wants to know the biggest bone you've ever found. Maybe that's going to be for the end. Should we save that yeah. one for the end? Let's save that one for the end. So stick okay. around if you ask that question. You'll see it at the end. And then somebody asked how you make the plastic fossils, the replicas. Yeah, that's a great question. So we do it two ways. The first is that sometimes we'll 3D laser scan a fossil and then print it out with a 3D printer. We've been doing a lot of that lately. And most of the time. Yeah, most of the time, exactly. And the other way we do it is we'll, we'll I've seen it. It's pretty cool. It's awesome. Yeah, we'll pour a rubber mold over a fossil. So first we make sure the fossil is nice and well preserved, and then we can pour a rubber mold over the fossil. It hardens, and then we can peel it off, and then pour plastic into that, and it makes exactly the same size and shape replica of the original fossil. That's a bit more. Um, it takes more skill uh, also, to do something like that. Um, if they do 3D print the fossil, it takes about two days. Yeah, it can take a long time to 3D print. Um, but what's neat is that my colleagues are finding fossils in South Africa, um, and then they can 3D laser scan them, send them to me over my email, and then I can just print them out with a 3D printer and have them in my hand, even though the original fossil is still thousands of miles away. And I can begin my study of it before I fly over to South Africa and see the original. These days, he with a lot of us lot. isolating, um, we've been able to continue doing our science because of that. Very cool. Somebody wants to know, um, what is your favorite bone that you have? And maybe you can then introduce a new bone. So one of my favorite fossils um, is this one here. And it's a, it's a leg bone. We know it's a leg bone because it looks like a leg bone. So here's a, here's a human femur. It's the biggest bone in your body. It's your leg bone. And this My is, back is stronger than steel. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So this femur here is shaped a lot like this one, right? This comes from an ancient human that lived 2 million years ago. This fossil here is 2 million years old. It was found in Kenya. And my favorite part about it is that this area right here is a healed fracture. So this individual walking around on two legs broke their femur, okay? And if this happens to you today, you're gonna to be in a cast, you're gonna need a doctor, you need to go to the hospital. It takes six weeks for this individual to have healed. And this was two million years ago, long before doctors and hospitals. And instead on the landscape would have been predators and things that, that, that could have eaten this individual, but, but they didn't. This individual healed. And what that tells me is that other members of the group probably took care of this poor ancient human after they broke their leg. And so we have been taking care of each other for a long, long time. We've exhibited compassion and care for each other for a long time. So this is my favorite fossil because it shows us very deeply what it means to be, to be human. Cool. 
Um, we keep getting lots of fossil questions. One, somebody wants to know, what should you study if you want to become a paleoanthropologist? So I studied biology in, studied in college. Yeah, I studied feet now, exactly. Ancient feet, fossil feet. Uh, when I was in college, I studied biology uh, and, and animal physiology. I was interested in just how animals work and how their hearts work and how their bodies work and how their brain works and how their bones and muscles work. Um, other people study geology because you really have to know about rocks if you're going to know how to find fossils uh, in those rocks. Like Carabao. Yeah, exactly. Like ancient fossils. Like, like One more. Um, I'm sorry. Why don't you go ahead? Um, sorry, I can't. Sorry, you. I have a dog barking in the background. Um, one more. Why don't you show your next skull? Oh, cool. All right. So this is this is one of my favorites. This one here. And you saw a drawing of it um, if you were here at the very beginning. So this is a skull with no teeth. And so sometimes we find animals that have no teeth at all. And so it can be hard to figure out what it is. But there are animals in our environment that have no teeth. And even though it has no teeth, you do not want to get bitten by this thing. So this here is a snapping turtle. Exactly. So there's the picture. You can see those similarities, right? And, and no teeth. And you can see teeth. that you do not want to get bitten by it. Exactly. So it's got really, really, really sharp edges uh, to its gums, to its jaw. Uh, and that helps it snap down and get uh, its prey. Um, just, let's see, what else can we do? So one of the other things that we can look at is how different skulls are similar to each other, and that helps us understand relatedness, okay? So remember, I had the skull of the coyote earlier, and now look at this one. They look really, really similar, don't they? And in fact, if I zoom this one in closer, they look almost identical. And it's because they're very closely related to each other. And earlier, Rebecca was making a beautiful drawing of this one howling, right? This was a coyote. And somebody guessed wolf, which would be bigger than the coyote. Much and somebody bigger. guessed fox, which would be smaller than the coyote. The coyote in between, uh, size in between a, a fox and a, and, a, and a wolf. And so what we have here is a close, these are close cousins. These are relatives of each other. A small one, this is a fox. And a bigger one, this is a, a coyote. And so when you have skulls that are similar in shape and teeth that are similar in shape as well, then we can figure out relatedness between organisms. Because the more closely related you are, the more similar you look. So when we find fossils, for instance, of ancient humans, they look a lot like us. When we find uh, monkey bones, they look a lot like human bones, just scaled down versions of them. Small differences make a, make a big difference in how an animal can move and what it eats, but still we can determine who's related to whom just based on the shapes of bones and teeth. Are there other questions? Yeah, so we have a couple more about where you find fossils. Mm -hmm. And somebody was also asking why South Africa, because you've mentioned that a couple of times. Yeah. So. Yeah. so we find fossils in a couple of different places. Sometimes we find them in ancient lakeshore environments. So if an animal dies on the edge of a lake and sinks into the mud, the mud there and the sand can get incorporated and actually replace the bone and turn into fossils. There are also, so, um, like, there are a lot of bones on the beach because there are a lot of um, really big and scary predators in the ocean. And you can find can a lot of bones on the beach and they can, ancient humans could use those to make tools. Okay, yeah, so all those things could, are possible. And they yeah. can find carcasses. And mm -hmm. So in, in South Africa, we find fossils in caves. Uh, caves are great places for bones to accumulate. In, in as Ben was saying, that uh, predators like leopards and hyenas will, will take animals off the landscape and then pull them into caves and, and, and eat them. Uh, and that included uh, uh, ancestors of ours. So sometimes we find bones uh, that are ancestors of ours that have bite marks on there them. There is a yeah. kind of famous picture, um, well, it's a skull basically. It has 
turn around, please. <laughs> right here. Yes. Which means that um, it was probably a leopard. Um, it was biting it, and the two front teeth were going into its eyes. Yeah. So there's some gruesome, gruesome fossils that we've that we have found. So fossil spots that we go to uh, in South Africa, I go to caves and search for fossils there. I often can't fit into a lot of these places, into the caves, and so um, I just look at the fossils that other people uh, have discovered. <laughs> and then uh, in other environments, it's more of a lakeshore environment that I work in. Oh, sorry, Ancient Somebody lakeshore. Wants to know if there's a fine... Oh, sorry, I interrupted you there. Anybody, it... Somebody wants to know if there's anywhere in New England that you can go to actually see fossils? But New England is one of the worst places to live if you're interested in finding fossils. I'm really, really sorry well, to say. My friend yeah. Luke, um, if you live in Norwich, then you um you would know this book. Um, he was playing with his friends um in Bloodbrook, and he saw a shiny white rock, and he and he walked right by it, and then a few minutes later, he walked back to it and picked it up. And it happened, it just happened to be a deer mandible. Okay, so you can find, yes, so you can find bones around here. Lots and lots and lots and lots of bones. If you do find a bone around here, um, the first thing you should do for, for those of you who are listening, um, uh, kids mostly, is tell an adult that you found uh, a bone. If you see any um, uh, uh, hair on it still, like fur flesh. on it, muscle on it, any flesh on it. Do not touch it. Yeah, leave it there. Let nature take its course. If you see bugs running on it, they're still eating what's there. So leave it there. Go back and visit it a little while later. And um, see if all the yeah. flesh is gone. And then, like but if it's one. bleach white, if it's, if it's all clean like this one here, then with some gloves, you can pick it up, put it in a bag. Luke um, didn't use gloves. Didn't yeah. have gloves. Well, you should wash your hands pretty well if you handle bones. And then uh, uh, you can bring it back to uh, your house and just a little bit of dilute bleach. Uh, will kill whatever was on it, um, and you can and you can keep that bone. It's really and then silly. try to identify it. That's the most that's the most fun is to try to figure out what it is that you've actually found. Sometimes he takes fossils yeah. home from his lab and puts them in beach. It is very stinky. It can be. It can be. So, so let's do the last poll. Actually, um, I was going to interrupt you just for a second and turn it back to Rebecca because she has some good recommendations for fossil oh, options in New England. And then I think actually we might want to jump ahead to the first poll that we did because we have about five minutes left okay. and we can share that. But let me go to Rebecca real quick. Okay. Of course. And if you want to see fossils in New England, you have to go on a little bit of a road trip. Um, the two closest we, ones we have, if you live in the Upper Valley in Vermont and New Hampshire, is driving south into Massachusetts. You can go and see dinosaur tracks preserved as fossils down to Massachusetts. You can go to the Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut or the Amherst Museum in Massachusetts does have a nice collection of fossils that they found there too. Or if you want to go north, you can go way up in the top of Vermont, up into the Champlain Islands, and there are fossils older than dinosaurs there of tiny little trilobites. So you can find some fossils if you have someone who can drive a while. All right, I'm going back to Jerry, and I think at the beginning you had either the oldest or the biggest. So which one do you want to start with? Okay, I want to start with the oldest. One of my, um, uh, one of the neatest things I think about living in this area is that the state fossil of the state of Vermont is a fossil called Charlotte. And Charlotte is a whale. It's a beluga whale. And there's uh, some wonderful stories about how did a whale get to Vermont? How did it get to a farmer's field uh, in Vermont? And there's a children's book by a woman named Erin Rounds, and I highly recommend uh, this, this book that tells the story of Charlotte, who is uh, a whale um, that is a, a fossil found uh, just south of Burlington, and it's the state fossil of Vermont. And so I'm not going to spoil the, the surprise for you of how that whale got to Vermont. Um, I'll let you figure that out. Um, if you can pick up this book or do some research on this whale. It's really, really neat. But I, I am fascinated by um, not just the evolution and the ancestry of humans, but also other animals as well, including, uh, including whales. And so I want to show you again, um, this is a human femur, right? This is a human leg bone. 
And this one here is also a leg bone, okay? See how it has a head to it? I'm gonna put it a little closer. It's got a head, just like ours. It's got an area for the knee down here, just like ours. But look how squished it is, right? Look how squished that is. It's almost like you took a human femur and just you know, squished it down into this. And this animal here is about the same size as a human, even though it has a tiny, tiny little squished femur. This is from a seal. Seals don't walk around on two legs, right, like we do. Animals with long legs move more uh, uh, on the ground and can cover greater distance. This here is a swimmer with its short, stocky legs that are powerful. So when you find a femur that's short and stocky, you know you have something that has powerful swimming abilities. Uh, digging too, but let's stick with swimming for a moment. This here is the oldest fossil that I have uh, in my lab. Uh, this is a um, roughly 50 million year old uh, femur. See, it's got a head and it's got a knee part. Um, and it's from an ancient whale. Now, what I love about this is that today, whales don't have legs. Whales don't have legs at all. There are no feet, no legs. They've lost their legs entirely. They used to be able to walk on land. But their ancestors could walk on land. They used to be kind of like crocodiles. Exactly. So something like this, um, with its femur, and it had long flipper-like feet, they used to live along shorelines and hunt in, in, in much a crocodile-like way. So this is a 50 million year old leg bone from an ancient whale. It shows us that over time, whales have changed. And one of the ways that they've changed is that they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I'm gonna take you outside and show you not the oldest thing that uh, I, I, I have, which was that leg bone, but the biggest. And it was so big that my efforts this morning to get it into my house didn't work. Um, it's so large that I had to keep it outside. And to give you a sense of how big it is, um, my kids are our props. And there it is. That there is the skull, just the skull of a whale known as a minke whale. And what I love about that and about the minke whale is that it is the smallest of the baleen whales. Baleen whales are the ones that filter feed. This is the smallest baleen whale. So imagine how big the skull of a humpback whale or a blue whale would be. And they're even larger. But that is a skull. So Ben, point out the nose right in front. All right, yeah, coming down, all the way down in front. Yeah, exactly, a snout. And then the eyes right would be right there exactly exactly That's a huge eye. and then the brain would be in the back so we can tell it's a skull because it's got the same kind of features that skulls have places for the nose places for the eyes and in this case no teeth but it would have a uh, uh, baleen the screen makes the um, skull seem a lot smaller than it actually is yeah <laughs> it's 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 pretty big so hopefully you enjoyed our exploration of bones and fossils today uh, and I'll stick around if there are more questions. Yeah thank you so much Jerry and um, I know some people have put questions into the chat that I maybe missed so if there is a question that we have not answered yet um, go ahead and repeat it and we'll stay on for a few more minutes. Um, we've been here for a half hour. If you want to share this with friends we will be putting this up on our YouTube channel um, in a few days. So if you had somebody who missed it but would like to see, we also on our YouTube channel have the creepy crawly ones that we did two weeks ago. So if you want to check out some cockroaches and stick insects, you can find that there. So we'll go back to questions. And um, yeah, I, let me see. I'm going to start with a couple. Somebody was asking about why did the whales go into the oceans or back to the oceans anyhow? Like, Yeah, it's a great question. I love why questions. Why questions are the best. Those are the kinds of questions that go on that, and on and yeah, on. Yeah, they do. And they do. They do. And they keep me up at night trying to figure out why are we the way we are? Why are whales the way they are? Helps them fall asleep. <laughs> I guess. Um, so one of the hypotheses is that whales were um, uh, eating uh, on the shorelines 
And then they started eating further out and further out and further out. And those individuals who had better adaptations for swimming the one, were the ones that survived, ate more, had more offspring. And then those offspring ended up looking like they did, which meant having more adaptations for swimming. And it just was this feedback loop. And they got better and better and better at it to the point that now they can't come back on land. Uh, or when a whale beaches itself, it actually can die. And somebody wants to know if they were bipedal whales. There's no, yeah, there's no evidence for any bipedal whales. Um, however, um, there, there used to be bipedal crocodiles. So there are fossils of nine foot tall crocodiles. Wait, is it in, in No, in, uh, uh, it's called um, uh, the Carolina Butcher is the name of the, the fossil. And it lived in North Carolina, what is today North Carolina. Uh, about 240 million years ago and it had long legs and tiny little arms like a t-rex but it was a crocodile and it could run on two legs so we think of crocodiles as living fossils that they haven't changed they have crocodiles many of them used to be bipedal that skull over there um my dad did you get in maine or yeah yeah it, it washed up in maine exactly it washed up um Cool. And that's how it died, probably. Yeah. yeah. Do you know the name of the species of the prehistoric whale that you had the the leg bone for? I've seen a picture. Of it. Uh, yes, a picture it's of it? it's uh, cetus It's called Myacetus. M a i a cetus. Great. Uh, C e t u s. And then um, early on, somebody wanted to know why you study fossils, and then to add to that, what's a bone that you wish you had that you don't have? that you want to find? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I study fossils because I'm fascinated by why we are the way we are today Dad, and, and how we've gotten to be this way. And uh, there's a bee, but hey there, fella. Um, and it absolutely fascinates me to think about the pathway by which we've become human. And to figure that out, one of the ways to figure that out is to study what we used to look like and how we used to behave and what changes have happened over the millions of years in our evolutionary journey. Uh, and so to me, you know, digging up these uh, ancient the one, fossils help us understand right, um, humans life. today and why we are the yeah. way we are today. Very cool. And what bone would you like to find that you haven't found yet? An ancient chimpanzee. Yeah. So we don't have, have a good fossil oh, record of chimpanzees. We actually have many, many fossils of, um, of early humans. We literally have thousands of fossils of early humans. We've documented our evolution very, very well, but um, ancient chimpanzee fossils are very, very rare. Uh, and we would love to know more about how they've changed. We have this idea in our heads, you've seen it on t-shirts, right? Of a chimp turning into a human, and that's just not how evolution works. No. Chimps have changed too. We just don't really have a grasp of how much they've changed because we don't have very good fossils of them. Very cool. Yeah. Here, let's let um, other folks ask okay. questions, okay? Somebody is interested about, um, it'll be a two part question again, when you found your first bone fossil and then um, what's something that you could share with us that we would find surprising about fossils that we would have never thought about? So um, when I was in college, I, uh, found some of those trilobites that Rebecca was talking about that are up near Burlington. Um, and those were so neat because they lived before the dinosaurs. They lived hundreds of millions of years before the dinosaurs. And it was so neat to think about how ancient the earth is and times in which there were, um, you know, that the, the, the planet was dominated not by humans and not by mammals and not even by dinosaurs, but by these wonderful sea invertebrates. Um, I think what most people are surprised by with fossils is that um, we will uh, find lots and lots and lots and lots of fossils. Or we'll, we'll, lurk, we'll look for a long time and not find many, and then we'll find a ton of them, and mostly they're of other animals. I think people um, sometimes are surprised by how rare human fossils actually are. And according to some estimates, and I think I, I, I would agree, I've experienced this myself, that for every about 10 to 20,000 fossils we find of other animals, we find a human fossil. And when I say human fossil, I don't mean a skeleton. I mean a single leg bone, like the one that I showed you earlier from Kenya that had that healed fracture, or a single jaw, or a single pinky bone, or something like that. So every fossil we find 
is incredibly precious um, and, and is important in telling this story of how we got to be here. Very cool. How are you feeling? You want a couple more questions or should sure. we? All That's right. Fine. We can do a couple more. All right. Um, so um, somebody's curious about what the first dinosaur was. Lots of dinosaur fans. Um, and then uh, what is one theory about how they went extinct? Oh, sure. So um, uh, dinosaurs um, are represented today really, really well by uh, modern day birds. Birds are essentially living dinosaurs. So, you know, it's really fun to look at a bunch of seagulls at a beach and imagine they're dinosaurs because they kind of are. Um, but birds today are closely related to, the most closely That's related things to dinosaurs. birds are alligators and, and crocodiles. And they share a common ancestor that goes back about 250 million years ago um, uh, 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 to creatures that were reptilian in many ways. They, many of them moved on two legs. Mm -hmm. And some of the first dinosaurs that we have fossils so from are about 240, 245 million years old. Uh, and it looks like they moved on two legs. So we think about those sort of plodding triceratops, stegosaurus, um, apatosaurus animals, but really the first dinosaurs were more upright and could move quickly, um, not quite like a velociraptor, uh, but more like an iguanodon or something like that. Um, so dinosaur evolution is very, very complex and very interesting. And each year researchers find more and more and more dinosaur fossils that are hel helping us understand their origin but we're also understanding their extinction uh, when most of them went extinct. Um, and that happened primarily because we think of a meteor impact uh, that happened in the Gulf of Mexico about 66 million years ago. And it would have been a, a, a horrific, uh, a traumatic event uh, for anything that was alive on the planet at that time. It would have been devastating. Um, at the same time, there were increased volcanic eruptions that were happening in modern day India a place called the Deacon Traps. And so we think that the, both of those together contributed to the extinction of most of the dinosaurs. And I say most because the feathered ones, many of them actually survived that extinction and lived on in our modern day birds. Very cool. All right, final question. Somebody wants to know if you've ever found a whole, whole animal. A uh, skeleton of, a, of an animal, yes. Um, we, we found have definitely, a beaver, a yeah, we found a beaver skeleton. On the top of a rock pile. Yep, we did. Um, uh, in terms of a fossil, an entire skeleton, uh, I would say no. The most um, famous is still not complete. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really hard to find complete skeletons. Is it Carabo? After an animal, animal dies, its bones um, oftentimes get taken by scavengers. Or like crumble, they yep. so old, like. Exactly, exactly. And some of them, like, like Carabo and his mom, they fell into a cave and that's how they died. Um, that's one theory. Um, yeah, so what Ben is referring to is a, an like, Australopithecus named Carabo who lived in South Africa about 2 million years ago. It's a really, really cool skeleton. Uh, and, and your listeners and viewers should, should look it up. Um, K-A-R-A-B-O, Carabo. Uh, it's an amazing discovery. And it was made, the discovery was made by a nine-year-old boy, sort of like you, you're nine, right? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, amazing discoveries you know made by made by kids. Awesome, um, guys. This is great. Thank you so much, Jerry and gang, um, for taking us through this. Um, for those of you uh, who've been doing the Montreal at home, next week it's going to be all about light. So more experiments to do there. And um, thank you all so much. And have a great day. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end it. So everybody have a Bye. good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.